Perry Marshall, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. It is great to be here. Um, you and I have known each other for a very long time, and we've reconnected, and it's a pleasure. So yeah. a comfortable pair of slippers, talking to Howie. So. <laughs> yep, I think last month was our 18-year anniversary since we met. Yeah, that'd be about right, come to think of it. So yeah, uh, yeah it's, I was thinking the other day, like, well, my kids don't know what it's like to know somebody for 20 or 30 years. It's kind of cool. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so we, yeah, we've traveled in the same circles. You are, you have been my Google AdWords teacher and mentor. Yeah. So you gave me, you gave me a start into a world that uh, treated me very well until I realized that it wasn't the right world for me. And we have um, reconnected in very, you know, interesting ways around health. And so let's, let's just start by, um, well, you've got a conference coming up. Yeah. You're you're a guy who um, you got your start like designing audio for cars. You became a sales guy. You became the Google AdWords guy, the 80-20 sales and marketing guy. I know you're deeply religious and you're interested in um, the intersection of science and Christianity. And you're putting out a conference about cancer. Like, so the Jewish word for this is like chutzpah, but like, what, like, dude, what are you thinking and why you? Well, so, um, it's not really about me at all. It's about the extraordinary people that have helped pull this together. Um, uh, so last November, uh, James Shapiro reached out to me and Shapiro is, um, he was mentored by Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize in 1983. Um, he, he's a professor at the University of Chicago. And frankly, he's been about 25 to 30 years ahead of the curve in evolutionary biology. And he and I have become friends. Um, I, uh, I created the world's largest science research prize, the Evolution 2.0 Prize, um, to find uh, what, what is the origin of information, which is a huge part of the origin of life question. I think it's also, as we'll get into, it's also a central question in, in the evolution science. And uh, we announced that at the Royal Society a year and a half ago with judges from Harvard, Oxford, MIT. So I have this side career as a science research and funding person um, and, and, uh, Dr. Shapiro, um, said, well, I've, I've teamed up with these two other guys, um, and would you help us put this conference together? And I said, absolutely. In a hot second, I'll help you put this together. Well, the other two guys, uh, one is Frank Laukin. He's a CEO of Bruker Corporation, which makes scientific instrumentation devices, and um, Henry Hang, who is a oncology researcher in Detroit. And uh, what happened was Henry Hang uh, started writing a book about 15 years ago. Uh, and in 2011, it was ready to be published. And one of the peer reviewers uh, threw, threw a fit. Um, and what Hang had done in this book is he had connected the dots between the progression of tumors and the Cambrian explosion and high-speed mechanisms of evolution. Um, the, the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion is what? Is 540 million years ago, there is a sudden, sharp increase in the number of species in fact, um, it's 40 new phyla in basically 1% of evolutionary history, you get 50% of the new, uh, of the new developments, okay? It, and it's so dramatic that old school evolutionists have tripped all of their, themselves trying to explain this. Darwin was trying to explain it and he couldn't, um, and um, the, the, the creationists and the intelligent design guys have had a field day with it. Um, but th the reason that evolution 
can happen so fast is that uh, organisms have an incredibly sophisticated toolkit for adapting. And there were very harsh conditions during that time, including a lot of drought. And so you see this massive proliferation of new body forms and body plans, and you go from simple things like mollusks to vertebrates. And, and Henry Hang looked at this and he said, purely based on my cancer research, I think evolutionary biology has mostly got this wrong because I have watched the speciation of tumors uh, progress at incredible speed. And, um, and, uh, and so he, he formed, really, you could almost say this whole new theory of evolution. Well, one of the, one of the peer reviewers threw a fit and the book got uh, trashed. And it, and it never saw the light of day. But then he, he started to figure out, well, guess what? There's a whole group of people in evolutionary biology who have already come to almost identical conclusions. Um, and this is not new. Um, there's, there's huge gold veins of literature about this. And so, um, so he and Shapiro got together and they, what, what they said was, you know what, you can't understand cancer until you understand evolution and you can't understand evolution without understanding cancer. And in fact, cancer is probably the fastest laboratory for understanding evolution. It's way better than looking at fossils or sequencing genomes of all kinds of, of animals because cancer is evolution that happens at incredible speed in, mm -hmm. in real time. All right. So, so what this cancer is about, the uh, conference is about. Gotcha. So, so my understand, I'm going to give you my straw man understanding of Darwinism. And it's not just a straw man understanding. It's the thing that if I disagree with, most of my science literate friends are going to think that I'm a fundamentalist Christian fanatic. Right. Right. So here it goes. Um, there is um, variation. Right. And variation is essentially random. And then there's selection so that and, and there's heredity. Right. So that if I an organism has a makes a baby or a copy of itself, that copy or baby is resembles the organism. And if two organisms get together sexually, then it's a mixed mosh of both of their characteristics. And through that, through that, through, um, and through random mutation of genes, new things happen. And then the environment votes yay or nay on whether that thing survives and reproduces. And so based on random genetics and mutation, evolution has occurred. Now, if you, so, and if you say that it's not random, then you must believe in like God controlling everything and humans, you know, it's humans are not related to monkeys. And I noticed that you mentioned 540 million years ago, which is already a lot longer than the 4,000 years of the biblical really, right? So first of all, did I get, is that basically evolution? Do I understand um, Orthodox Darwinism the way I just described it? Um, that is orthodox Dar Darwinism. Uh, that's pretty much like if you read a book like Darwin's Dangerous Idea by Daniel Dennett or The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, that's pretty much what you get. Okay. And this is what most people have been taught. It's been drilled into the heads of biologists for the last 75 years. And so, yeah, that that is the standard... Um, the that's the modern synthesis the standard model okay uh, so y you do you do have the talking points correct okay and and you're saying that cancer doesn't fit this theory now you sent i saw your email you sent out this morning where you had a line that i really like if the airplane doesn't fly change your theory right if the airplane crashes <laughs> your theory is wrong well uh, okay so so what Darwin could never really properly explain was why is it that these new species suddenly appear in the fossil record intact and complete with not very many intermediate forms and sometimes none at all? Like, how is that possible? Which was fantastic fodder for the, the creationists. 
And actually, I grew up a creationist, so I was programmed to believe the creationist version of this and go, yeah, I know, yeah, Darwin's a bunch of BS. But I went down the rabbit hole, and what I found was, no, like, you can get very rapid speciation. There's ways to do it. Um, botanists do it all the time with hybrids. Um, and every cell in existence has tools for cutting, splicing, rearranging its DNA, changing its genetics. And so the version of the story that you told me, so it's sort of right, except it's not random. And the part that's not random is like 90% of the story. And the part that you got right is only about 10% of the story. Okay, and so, and so it's, it, it's unbelievably fascinating. Like, if you had asked me 20 years ago, okay, so what would you think if you were like going to evolutionary biology conference, I would have thought, you got to be crazy. Like, why would anybody even be interested in that? Like, I, I thought that's just, that is like such a, well, like the way they describe it, it's so passive, it's so nihilistic and so kind of bureaucratic and boring like who would ever be interested in that um what i found the like the real actual science it totally geeked me out because i'm an engineer and it was the most incredible engineering i'd ever seen in my life so um i'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the things i still don't understand i know there's um so you talked about botanists able to sort of recreate this sort of cambrian explosion through hybridization now when i was in, in the farthest I ever got was island biology freshman year of college with, with Robert May, who did, uh, I think he won some Nobel Prize or something, but uh, I didn't understand a word of what he was saying. <laughs> so I'm not trying to ride in his coattails, but there was, I understand, there was a difference between they, they do artificial and natural selection. And oh. artificial selection is could sped up because it's what humans are doing on purpose. And it sounds like you're saying that it's not that different, that, there, that natural selection is also teleological, meaning there's also a, a, a purpose behind it and not just random. Well, if you, if you think about any ecosystem, um, natural selection is only as smart as all the competitors are, okay? It, it's, it, it's no smarter and no dumber. So, so, um, so, how we, you and I uh, spent years in the trenches together doing Google advertising, okay? And um, in, so Google advertising is exactly like biological evolution. Uh, you have replication, variation, and selection. And selection is the marketplace, and you don't get to decide what the marketplace likes, okay? But the marketplace is made up of what? other living organisms that also have wants and needs and desires. And so that's why niches, whether marketing, business, ecological, or whatever, are, are sophisticated. It's because they're inhabited by sophisticated beings, okay? And so natural selection is usually described in this very abstract, ethereal, it, it, it basically has is given all of the characteristics of a deity, only they're, you know, they're really insisting that there's no deities and there's, you know, <laughs> but, but it, 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 it has all of those things. Um, but, but then human, okay, so you have human natural selection. Human natural selection is in some ways more directional um, because, because, natural natural selection like they've they found this in the galapagos islands so you have drought years and you have lots of rain years and very as soon as the drought years start happening the the population will mi migrate towards birds that are really good and hardy and low moisture environments and then and then when it's rainy years it swings back the other way and it but it, but it ends up like going back and forth a, across a, like a center line where human human selection can actually push things very hard in certain directions um 
but but I guess the bottom line is that natural selection is not the driving force. It's just the eliminator. Okay, uh, it it just natural it, selection doesn't cause any of the variations. It just no. vote it just votes on them. No, in it in in dozens and hundreds and hundreds of books, natural selection is described in such a way that that would lead you to believe that it has some kind of sense of direction or that it somehow creates something. It doesn't create anything. And this is a major point. So all the creativity has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So when I think of like natural selection, and this is a sense of how unsophisticated I am about it, I think about cereal with raisins, where the raisins all end up at the bottom. And it's just, it's just physics, right? There's, there's holes that they fall through, they're, heavy, they're denser. Yeah. Right, like, so yeah. is, that, is that the, like, the environment? And it's just the question of how much you shake the box? Well, so ecosystem, like real ecosystems, whether they're in business or biology, like I, I happen to think the business and biology are very, very, very similar. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the business has to be a subset of ecology because it's about stock, stocks and flows. Right, right. It's, it's how the humanity feeds itself. Of course, it's just like biology, right? Mm -hmm. So ecosystems have all of these different participants, right? So you go in the forest, and there, there's, there's like uh, 200 species of insects, and there's dozens of species of birds, and there's all of these trees, and all of these weeds, and all of these worms, and like, and they're, they're all like, it's this very complex thing, right? And in business, it's the same thing. You walk into a store, a store is an ecosystem. Like, well, you know, we got our Apple products, we got the Windows products, we got, you know, the MP3 mm -hmm. players, right? I mean, so, so natu natural selection is, it's, it's, an, it's an abstraction that in business terms, it's like, well, what did the market really want? And what survived, you know, the culling process. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, I mean, it's it seems so one. Th all right. So one thing you talk about is you um, you talk about like the individual players at some level have cognition. Mm -hmm. Like like I flatter myself to think that I have cognition, mm -hmm. right? Like I go, I have a garden. And I would say, you know, a good 20% of the things that are happening in the garden are because I wanted them to happen. Yes. Right? There's a lot of things yeah. that are happening that I didn't want to happen, and I put a lot of sweat and tears into not happening, but they happened anyway. But, like, the garden occurred because I had wants, desires, and strategies to act upon them. So are you saying that... Um, that organisms that's like but that's me that's like i'm an individual we you can understand that indiv like an individual elephant or a rat or a fish has programmed cognitions or or some sort of consciousness but but is there like a meta consciousness of a species that says this is okay if things look tough in the cambrium let's all do this well so so i don't know how to answer that question on on a whole species level but one of my one of my favorite stories is what Barbara McClintock actually discovered that it won her a Nobel Prize 40 years later. And what she discovered was she she was hacking corn plants with radiation. She was like, let's hit a corn plant with radiation, let's damage its chromosomes, and let's see what it does. And she had this idea of what it was gonna do. And it threw her complete curveball because what it did was it, 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 it made significant restructuring of itself to repair the damage and the repairs that it did were completely unique to that plant. Mm. Okay, so this would be like, this would be like going through your Windows registry on a Windows computer, um, deleting random, like deleting little random folders and mixing stuff together and corrupting files and the computer goes, uh, we have a problem here. And it starts rearranging things. And it goes, well, you know, there's a whole file folder here that's missing. And I don't even know what was in there. 
but here, let's modify this other folder, stick that in there, that should work. And this is what this plant did in real time. Well, I think if, if you, and she didn't have to kill 100,000 plants to get one that actually did this. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if, if, if hardly any of the plants actually died. Maybe some of them did. But one thing's for sure, that plant did not make that repair by accident. It knew at some level what it was doing, and it was anticipating the future in doing it, okay? Which, in my opinion, makes that one of the most significant science experiments in history. Because she was the first person to observe an evolutionary change and genetically figure out what happened after it happened. Mm. Nobody had ever done that before, okay? And this completely turns evolution upside down because the plant was an agent of its own evolution. And, and I maintain that is always the case, and here's why. So let me give you another example. So one of my friends is um, John Torday at UCLA. He is a pediatric toxicology scientist. He studies the effect of secondhand smoke on children. He has cataloged 300 effects of secondhand smoke. The number one worst one effect on the list is asthma inherited epigenetically. So a woman smokes, her body is like, I don't like the cigarette smoke. It starts doing all of these things. It starts changing its epigenetics, which is the expression of genes. Those changes are made to maintain homeostasis against a, a, a toxic threat. They, the, the epigenetic changes get passed through her egg to her daughter. Those get passed to her granddaughter. So a little girl who may have been born after the grandmother died and may have never been in a room with a smoker before, has asthma inherited from the changes in her grandmother's body, okay? That is real-time, purposeful, contextual evolution. It's also an um, inheritance of an acquired characteristic which for a hundred years, the old version of evolution told you was totally impossible and laughable, turns out to actually be true. In, meaning that basketball players get taller? Well, <laughs> well, maybe basketball players get taller, but, but uh, I mean, maybe that's, I mean, maybe, okay, let's, let's pick another example. Um, you, you play the guitar, you get calluses on your fingers. The calluses are epigenetic changes in your skin. Now, I don't know, please don't misquote me, but it may be possible that the calluses or the ability to develop the calluses faster could go to your children so that they could play the guitar more easily. And epigenetics is such a fast-growing, burgeoning field right now we don't even know what it's capable of or not capable of. But this, once again, this completely flips up evolution upside down. Right. Now, everyone who listens to my podcast knows, if they're paying attention, that like epigenetics is like the name of the game in lifestyle medicine. Yeah. There's, there, it's, but, but there's still, it feels like there's still a fence around it. Like, well, that's not real genetic changes, right? Because it's still, the genes are the same. They're just expressing um, differently. Is, um, I mean, what do you say to that? Well, well those, those changes can pass through dozens of generations and sometimes they can become permanent. Um, there's, I mean, th what we're talking about right now is re at the bleeding edge of science. Now, I mean, I've read a ton of papers about this stuff and there's, there is no question that epigenetics is a major factor in evolutionary history. It's not like this minor little thing. Mm -hmm. okay? And, it, and it, it means that you're not just some passive recipient of your unfortunate genes. Like the old view is very disempowering. It's like, well, 
you know, there's this big cosmic lottery, you got what you got, it was all random and accidental. Well, not only can you change your own genetics, you can change your children's genetics and your grandchildren's genetics by not smoking, eating right, the right thing, exercising, and we don't even know the extent of it. So this, this completely, honestly, it, it blows old school evolutionary biology out of the water like to the point where evolutionary biology has been built on quicksand for the last 75 years. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess par par partly because it's been built on quicksand, it's been so resistant to change, right? Incredibly. There is no, I have consulted in 300 industries. I have never seen an industry more resistant to evolving than evolutionary biology. <laughs> it, now, now, this is changing. This is changing very fast because the old school guys lost this battle four years ago. Um, Dennis Noble organized a meeting at the Royal Society. Um, 21 members of the Royal Society tried, uh, signed a petition and tried to get the meeting canceled. They got it to go anyway. And I was at that meeting and it was like being Forrest Gump. It was like, I can't believe I was here <laughs> when this happened because I was hearing things that I was never accustomed to hearing from a mainstream stage in science. Um, and and the, a couple of the old school guys were there and watching them backpedal and mumble excuses was it was just astounding to watch it happen. And ever since then, that entire crowd has refused to engage. So I've got a video on my YouTube channel where Dennis Noble says, hey, Richard Dawkins, Jerry Coyne, Daniel Dennett, any of you guys, I'll debate you any day of the week. Just name the TV station, name the radio, name the podcast, I'll go head to head. They won't even touch it. Why? Because they know they cannot possibly win. It can't be defended anymore. Okay, so I'm going to give you another example because you started out by talking about this is about information. Yeah. So the corn plant, Barbara McClintock's corn plants, or my calluses, or the granddaughter's asthma are all direct impact on their genes or their genetic line or th their own experience. Yeah. But then you like the, the, the examples I remember when I learned evolution was like flightless birds on islands. Mm. Right. Somebody comes under the ship, a snake gets off and all of a sudden the birds are gone. Yeah. Now. So if I'm the flightless bird and I haven't seen a snake, I, there's no evolutionary pressure on me to change. Right. Right. So. So part of me wants to ask, is that like, is that the same sort of thing? Part of me wants to throw the name Rupert Sheldrake into, yes. into this conversation. To, where, where's the most useful place to go? Because I'm, I'm already really confused. Well, well, okay, so, so you got all these flightless birds. Why are they flightless? There, there were no predators. So like, um, I've been to Beganish Island off the coast of Ireland and birds lay their eggs in the grass. And when I went on the island, we, we got too close to some of the eggs. And then all of a sudden the birds were furious and for the next half an hour, ow, 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 like there's like 200 birds flying around our heads and they're all mad, okay? Well, you know, if there were minks or skunks or rats or anything else in these islands, then they would have had to lay them somewhere else and like it wouldn't do this, right? So it's very common with islands that you'll have, you'll have, uh, you have these like protected ecosystems. Now, if, if, if the birds have enough time um, to adapt before they go extinct, they'll probably learn to fly, okay? Um, and and there's, there is no question that environmental stresses cause evolutionary events to occur and they, they cause this machinery to switch on. And th this actually gets you into cancer because so um, a couple of the speakers at the symposium are Paul Davies and, um, and his partner, um, Kimberly Bussey. And uh, Paul is a physicist. And he got a call, I don't know, 10 years ago from some cancer organization. They go, 
we were wondering if we could hire you to do cancer research. And he goes, I'm a physicist. I don't know anything about cancer. He goes, well, that's why we're calling you. We want some <laughs> fresh thinking. And so, and so they, they started in on this. And these two are brilliant. And they, they, came to the, they started studying some of the genetics patterns. And they said, well, some of the genetic changes that happen are very similar to stuff that we see emerging in bacteria 600 million years ago. We think cancer is a primitive response to stress. And we believe that what is happening is that the organism is getting shocked by stress and it's rebooting into Windows safe mode, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you ever had that happen to you where your computer you know, restarts and it's like, well, this is a protective mode to keep, uh, you know, to keep damage from happening. And then it, and I'm kind of synthesizing the thinking of several people here. Um, it, it wakes up thinking it's a single cell instead of a member of an organism. The cancer is a disease of identity okay, which is very teleological, it's very cognitive. And then when the body, the immune system or chemotherapy start attacking it, it switches on its evolutionary machinery. And, and it's, it's just existing like a single organism in whatever environment it found itself in. So now it starts proliferating then you hammer it with chemo, you kill 90% of those cells, and guess what happens to the 2% you don't kill? You get one species proliferating into a thousand species, and now you're fighting a thousand species of cancer, which is impossible. So and what's, four months later, Aunt Sally is dead. Okay. So what's the evidence that someone could have a thousand different species of cancer? So if you read a book, a book called Genome Chaos by Henry Hang, he makes it very clear. You could go from one species to a thousand species in a month because the cells start doing massive rearrangements of their genomes, okay? So you'll, you'll go, you, you get multiple kinds of plo, uh, like uh, polyploid, diploid, haploid, you get, you get um, you get cells with different numbers of the parents' chromosomes. You get, you get complete rearrangements of chromosomes. You get changes to the karyotype, which is the shape in which the chromosomes are packaged. And all of this happens at, at incredible speed. Mm. And so, do, so if you want to go look up two terms for those who are really geeky, if you go look up chromothripsis or chromoplexy, those are massive genomic reorganizations that happen in cancer. All right. I can't, I can't win a debate about someone who can say polyploid and chromothipstripsis. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw in the towel. Um, but isn't, isn't there a possibility that if you have a thousand different species that they would fight each other? Well, they're all competing for resources. So from that standpoint, it's, it's Darwinian on a nanoscale. But they're mm -hmm. actually recruiting blood vessels and tissues and nutrients away from the other organs. So you have a tumor that's saying, hey, blood vessels, hey, like all you guys, give us more. And the body respond, they, they're like, uh, okay. And they start building more blood vessels and pretty soon, um, you know, your, your brain's not getting enough nutrients and your tumor's getting fat. And of course, we've all, almost all of us have, have seen this. Uh, happen with our friends and relatives. Hmm. Now, like, so the, the standard, again, I'm going to give you the textbook cancer thing that I learned is it's a random mutation. We all have cancerous cells, cancerous processes going on in, inside of us all the time. Um, and there are various things that can trip it into something clinical, like radiation, like an exposure like a, um, a bacterium or a virus. And, but, it's, but basically, in treating cancer, we're trying to kill it, and we're trying to um, deal with the fact that it's, it's, it's randomly mutating. Well, right? so there is, there is certainly some truth to that. And 
uh, like one thing we know about cancer is that many, many kinds of cancers, the P53 gene got deleted, which is the kill switch. It's called apoptosis, it's programmed cell death. Cells are supposed to die when certain things go wrong, um, or even like when, a, when an embryo is forming um, the, and you have the webbing between the baby's fingers, um, uh, that programmed cell death will kill the cells between the fingers so the baby is born without webs, okay? So this is a very important um, part of the process. But the P53 gene has gotten killed, and so there's no kill switch. Mm. And so now you have cells that are basically immortal. Like cancer is a form of immortality, um, uh, but it's willful. See, I think, I think one of the biggest mistakes in the history of science is it's, it's been drilled into biologists' head that natural selection is the only directional force in evolution and natural selection has no goals. Well, that, both of those are wrong. So it's the cell that has goals and the goals are not random and the cell is an active participant in its own evolution. Okay, so when you're fighting cancer, you're fighting an intelligent entity and it knows how to adapt. And, it, and so it's, you know, it's, it, it's exact, it, if you take a hundred entrepreneurs and you put them through a big giant crisis, oh, I don't know, let's say like a pandemic, for example, okay? <laughs> and, you know, and let's, let's say there wasn't any like government bailout money or anything like that, okay, what would happen? Well you might kill 83 of your 100 people. And, and what, 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 what about the 17 you got left? Well, they all proliferate into all these other businesses and one or two of them becomes a billionaire and they might've just like kept running their bowling alley if the disaster had never happened, right? Like this always happens, okay? Well, what I just described is fractal. It happens on every level of life that there is. Um, all the way down to the single cell. And so, so cancer is, so if you assume cancer is just dumb random mutations, that's sort of like if a bomb went off at the mall down the street and you go, oh, you know, I think that was just random. No, it's mm -hmm. not. You, you, you'll never, this is why we've spent a quarter of a trillion dollars on cancer in the last 40 years and phase uh, stage three and four patients are no better now than they were in 1930. Okay. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask you about um, the junk DNA. <laughs> All right. That term has no place in any modern informed conversation about biology. That term is totally obsolete. And frankly, I think the people that invented that word should, uh, they should be driving cabs for a living instead of calling themselves scientists. That, that is a total abdication of, of people's job as a scientist. What, where that came from was in the 1970s. Um, they figured out that 3% of our DNA codes for proteins and they didn't know what the other 97% did. And they saw that it had a bunch of repeating patterns and a bunch of what they thought was gibberish. And so they de declared that it was junk. Oh, so that's, that's basically what I did in high school to like poetry. Yeah. 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 Like, you didn't this, this makes no sense. This is yeah, crap. I don't understand Steinbeck. Oh, that's <laughs> just a bunch of crap. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what that is. Okay. Okay. And so. Oh man, get me started. It just makes me angry. <laughs> so what does that have to do with evolutionary biology the way you understand it and with cancer? It's where all the interesting stuff is. Okay. So um, so all of you know, all that 97% uh, of our DNA that's allegedly junk, well, it is it is the raw material for new evolutionary changes. It is um, 
like all of the epigenetic stuff happens there. All of the transposition happens there. So for example, um, 200, there are 287,000 transposable elements that are part of our quote unquote junk DNA that are shared by humans and primates. Um, uh, uh, there's a huge, uh, I think about 8% of the human genome is retroviruses, which got inserted. Now, in a sense, you could call those junk because the, 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 uh, the, the humans that got those didn't intend to get them and they probably got sick. And some of them died when they got those viruses. But when an organism has a bunch of code like that, it figures out things that it can do with it. So for example, as far as anybody can tell, the mammalian placenta was built from codes stolen from retroviruses. Okay, so like literally true, you go look this up. All right, so like we think of viruses as these evil things. Viruses are the open source repository for evolutionary change. Okay, so we've got COVID-19 and about a, a jillion trillion other viruses floating around and viruses have a very symbiotic relationship. So there, there's at least 10 viruses for every cell and bacteria on earth. Like 10 to one, like one drop of seawater has like a million viruses in it. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're and, everywhere. And the way you describe it, viruses are like just sort of pure information. Yeah, you could say mm. that, right. Uh -huh. And here, here's a way of thinking about so a virus is a non-living thing. Like if it's on your kitchen table, it would just sit there forever. Okay. Until it maybe it decomposed or something. It's not, it's not, it's not swimming around or doing anything like a bacterium, but when a virus makes contact with a cell, sometimes it's, it, it gets in and then all of a sudden, so here's an analogy to what it's like. So let's say you're going to a campfire tonight and you, and you throw your guitar in the car and you're, you're driving towards a campfire and you're listening to music. And um, you hear, hey Jude on the radio. And then you hear, you can't always get what you want by the Rolling Stones. And you get to the campfire and everybody's singing and stuff. And you go, hey guys, here, try this. And you go, hey, Jude, you can't always get what you want. Okay. And you do this medley, right? And, and it's kind of funny. And then it, it becomes the joke and everybody, you know, uh, and, and then somebody like takes it and they, they go to some other thing that they, 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 they play your song at, at amateur night in a pub next Tuesday. So I got a question, Howie. Is Hey Jude a living thing? <laughs> oh, now, now we're getting into memes, aren't we? Yeah. Is, is the is song it, Hey Jude alive? In, in depend, well, if we define it live in terms of able to travel, replicate, um, you know, reproduce, you know, probably not like, you know, breathe and poop, but, uh, right. but it, it, it shares characteristics of living things. Yeah. So, so, you know, when it's on a compact disc or a USB stick, or when it's a vibrations from a speaker, it's not alive. But as soon as it gets inside of a human being, mm -hmm. like, you're saying things you wouldn't have said, you're dancing, you wouldn't have been dancing, it changes your mood. Okay, I argue that the relationship between viruses and hosts is just like the relationship between Hey Jude and you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and so like a song or a virus is like on the 
dotted line between living and non-living things. And it's just a matter of what context it's in. And notice who, who rewrote the song? Who did the mashup? Mm. You did. Yeah. Okay. And so like there are, there are all kinds of experiments where mice that had a virus would not get a disease, but my, mice that did not have a virus would get a disease because the virus would actually keep them from, from uh, responding to that disease. And so viruses are actually a very important thing. I, I, I bet you that, that by the time this whole pandemic has um, run through its, run its course, that human physiology will have actually gained in functionality as a result of mm -hmm. the fact that this happened. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so it's really interesting when you talk about like this idea of cancer as a disease of identity mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so it just, it just, it just seems very sort of selfish in, in a very rational way. Like if I'm the only thing that matters, then naturally I'm going to grab everything for myself. Yes. Um, and you'll kill the host. Right. Well, yeah. I mean. You know, is humanity a cancer? Well, well, it, it depends entirely on what we choose to do. See, I, I argue that cancer is, is a matter of volition. It's like, what have these cells chosen to do? And, and whether we're a asset to the planet or whether we're a parasite on the planet is up to our volition. Like, I think volition is the central question in all of life. There's some scientists that want to pretend it doesn't even exist. Well, that's a materialistic position for you. Uh -huh. Meaning that there's an I want. Right. Right. So, I, yeah. So, I remember back in the day reading um, one of our favorite books, Gerd Lescher Bach, and then following it up with Daniel Dennett's The Mind's Eye. And I was really convinced because he's such a great writer um, that I didn't exist and that, there, that, that my consciousness was an illusion. <laughs> Right, that, that, that's, that's kind of mainstream. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, I think the notion, the, the notion that we don't have consciousness is an illusion, right? Now, I can't like how we, I could live in the solipsistic world where I believe that I'm the only person with self-awareness and that you don't have it, my dog doesn't have it. Like I could try to live that way, but I just think it's interesting that you know, every civilization um, that, I, that I've ever heard of has treated human beings like they actually have choices. And it's like, well, you know, if you, if you kill the guy, they, they put you on a noose because you had a choice. And we want to teach all the other creatures with choices that you don't do that, right? Like, this is like axiom number one of civilization, right? So what amuses me about about people like Daniel Dennett. Like, I, I think people like Daniel Dennett are way better marketers than you and I ever were. Because they can, they can convince people of things that are so obviously untrue, right? <laughs> um, but so it's like, well, you know, um, like what Daniel Dennett says something to the effect that, uh, that, that if, if you can describe all the characteristics of color, then you understand color. Like, he doesn't even like um, as as though knowing how many nanometers the wavelength of red is is somehow equivalent to experiencing red, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, the but anyway, yeah. you're gotcha. getting beyond it. Yeah, in all right. Well, short amount of time, I probably. Right, so you uh, you saw you back channeled me that we have a hard stop, so. Oh, can you briefly describe the conference, what you hope will come out of it, and who should attend? So the conference is October 14 to 16 on Zoom. It's at cancerevolution.org. Uh, we have what I call blue chip renegades. And these are people from Harvard, Yale, MIT, um, Johns Hopkins, Oxford, MD Anderson, uh, some of the best scientists, you know, widely published, widely quoted, widely cited 
but they disagree with the standard models. Okay, so um, the evolutionary biologists disagree with the standard mo model of evolutionary biology. And, um, and the, the cancer presenters, uh, at least in part, disagree with major t common assumptions in the cancer business. And we have gotten these two people together, um, ex really extraordinary people. And okay, so who should attend this? Well, you shouldn't attend if you, like if you struggle with the terminology, like if this conversation has been significantly over your head, I wouldn't bother, okay? But if like, if you're able to track what we're talking about, if you know medical terminology or a thing, oh, I'm really sorry about this. Um, right. That's that, my hard stop reminder. Oh, it's a um, damn, damn volitional cell phone. <laughs> if, if you uh, are comfortable talking about things like epigenetics, then I think this conversation, uh, this conference will be great. And w I, I believe that we can create a sea change in the way cancer is understood, detected, and treated. And I am, I am incredibly excited about this. Okay. Can you say one word about treatment? Like, is there anything on the horizon based on these blue chip renegade ideas? Well, early detection is everything. And I'll just tell you this. Um, this has gotten me into conversations with a lot of, like a lot of interesting people, like way outside my normal circle. And you know what I keep hearing is, Harry, I have seen some really dark sides of the cancer industry. I have seen chemotherapy companies buying out early detection companies so that they can mothball them. Okay, um, the 80% of cancer money is spent on, um, on like trying to cure stage three and stage four and all of the leverage is in detecting it long before that ever happens. Mm. And that, that's going to be a major theme. All right. Um, you have, how much time do you have left? You got to go right now? Like one minute. One minute. All right. So in my understanding was that early detection was a moneymaker because you could then start treating more people who had cancers that would never progress. Like most people, most men will have prostate cancer, but it won't kill them. Is so this a whole, a whole other conversation? Or I, a... I don't know. I, I, I think that is a totally legitimate objection and it could certainly be abused. And I would just, uh, Caveat emptor, it's clearly that could be abused. Um, and so there's, boy, uh, you know, one thing's for sure is like, you better love your patient more than you love your credentials and your paychecks and, you know, and, and all that other stuff. So. Gotcha. All right. So um, for the conference, if I can't make it or can't make all of it, replay is available. Yes, yes we're going to have recordings of all of it. We, we also have live Q&A sessions with a bunch of the different speakers a week following, and those will be on Zoom. And so, um, so if you want to go deep, you can go deep. All right. Well, you know, my, my hobby is guitar. Your hobby is curing cancer. I feel <laughs> great about myself. Thanks, man. Hey, if you play guitar and spread some joy <laughs> in the world, you're going to help people not get cancer. I am sure of that. <laughs> Thanks, dude. <laughs> Perry, Perry Marshall, thank you so much. Thank you, Howie. Okay. Take care. Bye.